This is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Jackie Leonard. These are our main stories. Demonstrators at Hong Kong Airport are warned they could be jailed for the rest of their lives if there's any more disruption. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan says India has made a strategic blunder over Kashmir. And we'll have the latest from Stockholm and the ASAP Rocky case. Also in this podcast, it's a year since a major bridge in Italy collapsed, killing 43 people. For their families, it's been a long wait for answers. My job now is to get justice for Henry. That's my life. Because they took a part of me. They took a person who was fundamental to me. And what was so offensive about an advert for cheese that got it banned? Find out later. Police in Hong Kong have criticised pro-democracy activists for detaining two people during protests at the territory's airport. The airport, one of the world's busiest, is now attempting to return to normal following a second night of disruption. Violent clashes broke out between police and protesters. One officer was videoed drawing his gun after being attacked with his own truncheon for manhandling a woman. Hong Kong's assistant police commissioner, Mak Chin Ho, said any more disruption would result in severe punishment. If any person commits willfully in an aerodrum any act of violence which causes or is likely to cause death or serious personal injury and endangers or is likely to endanger the safe operation of the aerodrome or the safety of persons in the aerodrome is liable on conviction to life imprisonment. Our correspondent Steve McDonnell has been at the airport. Well, effectively, they have killed the protest actions inside the Hong Kong terminal. Now, how have they done that? You cannot now get access to the building without a passport and an itinerary. Now, there still are hundreds of protesters down on the arrivals floor, but they were here before this new security was put in place. And what will happen now is that as they leave, they won't be able to replenish their numbers. As it is, I think many protesters had decided not to come back to the airport tonight again anyway because of those shocking scenes we saw overnight, the the violence, the clashes, and, and by monitoring the online chat groups the protesters have, you can see that really they were never going to come back here anyway. But now that this new arrangement is in place, it effectively means there will be no more protests inside the terminal building. Now, we've obviously heard from some frustrated travellers, some with more or less sympathy for the protesters, and I've been following you on Twitter, at Stephen McDonnell, and you've been talking about the the, um, apology leaflets that the protesters have been handing out. Yeah, so, well, today, we came in by train, it's one of the easiest ways for people who have travelled to Hong Kong, and... At that, at that point where you board the train, activists were handing out leaflets saying, we apologise for our behaviour, but we're just too scared. Uh, the leaflets say our police shot us, government betrayed us, social institutions failed us. Uh, please accept our sincere apology to all travellers. Also, we're not to say we can do better. I think this is an indication that they're aware that they potentially lost a bit of public sympathy last night with those clashes and also by inconveniencing travellers. I mean, if you shut down all outgoing flights at an airport for two days in a row, and we saw the scene where there was a deliberate attempt to block people getting through customs, their view is that, you know, you need to cause economic pain in order to somehow or other force the government to bring about these economic reforms. However... You can also imagine how you can lose sympathy sympathy from people who who, who have no qualms necessarily with the protest movement but just want to get on board a flight. That was Stephen MacDonald in Hong Kong. For the past 10 days, Indian-administered Kashmir has been in lockdown. Thousands of extra security forces have been patrolling the streets, telephone and internet services were suspended and protests banned. It follows a decision by Delhi to revoke the region's special status. That decision, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan reiterated on Wednesday, was, he said, a strategic blunder, which Delhi would pay heavily for. He was addressing the local parliament in Muzaffarabad, the capital of Pakistani-administered Kashmir. Our correspondent Sekunder Kamani was listening. 
Imran Khan coming here on Pakistani Independence Day was clearly intended as a message of solidarity to the Kashmiri people. And from his speech, it seemed as if he had at least two uh, audiences in mind, a domestic one, uh, Pakistanis and those living in Pakistani administered Kashmir and the international community. For the first domestic audience, he promised uh, to become an ambassador for the Kashmiri people, vowing to take up the cause of Kashmiri independence at every possible forum. Uh, for the international community, um, he called on the United Nations uh, to take action and become involved in, in resolving this dispute uh, in order to try and galvanize international opinion against Indian actions in Indian-administered Kashmir. He repeatedly compared uh, the ideology of the ruling uh, right-wing Indian government to that of the Nazi party in, in Germany in the 1930s and 40s. So he's trying to galvanize international opinion. What will, do you think, his next step be? Uh, well, it's not clear whether this diplomatic offensive that uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan's government is embarking on will yield results. So far, the response from the international community has been rather muted. Uh, Indian uh, officials, of course, say that what they're doing in Kashmir is an internal issue uh, and, and they deny any allegations of human rights abuses there. Uh, officials here in Pakistan have been fairly clear that they're, they're not considering active military action unless India launches some kind of attack against them first, in which case Prime Minister Imran Khan said that, of course, Pakistan would respond in kind. But overall, Pakistani authorities want to portray themselves as the responsible ones in this dispute. Uh, uh, but it's not quite clear what options they have to them So um, beyond this diplomatic offensive. So for the moment, tensions are arising, uh, but it's not quite clear where all this will end. That was Sikandar Kamani in Mazafarabad. To Sweden now, and the verdict in the court case of the US rapper ASAP Rocky. He was charged over a street brawl in Stockholm, and the case received attention worldwide, including from President Trump. Our reporter there is Maddie Savage. Well, both ASAP Rocky and two others who were on trial have been found guilty of assault. They were involved in a fight in Stockholm at the end of June and the judgment ruled that they were not, as they said, acting in self-defence and that they assaulted the victim by hitting and kicking him. And they were given a what's called a conditional sentence here in Sweden, a suspended sentence. That means they do not have to return to Sweden to spend any more time uh, behind bars. They already spent a month in custody ahead of the trial. Uh, so not the not guilty verdict they will have been hoping for, but I think for a lot of ASAP Rocky's fans, a sigh of relief that he will remain free in the outside world and won't be required to spend any more time in detention. And as I mentioned, this became you know, something of a cause celebre. It had international attention. Why was President Trump so interested? President Trump got involved in the case after he heard about it from his wife and from uh, Kanye West, the other US rapper who has connections to, to Donald Trump and had been calling for ASAP Rocky's release from detention. That's because they felt it was unfair that he was being kept in custody uh, for so long. Uh, they wanted him to be given bail. But that's actually something that doesn't exist in Sweden. You can't pay money to be released from custody here. Uh, Donald Trump even phoned the Swedish Prime Minister to see if he would intervene, but he said there's an independent justice system here no matter who calls or tweets about it. So that attracted a huge amount of global attention but far fewer journalists here today uh, to uh, witness the verdict uh, but I think a lot of people around the world uh, very interested still uh, to find out what ASAP Rocky's fate would be. We now know uh, a guilty verdict but a suspended sentence. That was Maddie Savage in Stockholm. The U.S. Attorney General William Barr has ordered changes at the New York jail where the businessman Jeffrey Epstein died as he awaited trial on sex traffic charges. Epstein was found hanged in his cell on Saturday. A warden has been moved from his post and two officers have been placed on leave. More from our North America correspondent, Peter Bowes. We know now the two officers have been uh, suspended on administrative leave and the warden at the prison has been reassigned to a, a different job at another prison while the investigations into the circumstances surrounding Jeffrey Epstein's death continue. Two major investigations, the FBI and also the Justice Department. We also have learned that one of those uh, prison guards wasn't in fact a fully-fledged prison guard, that he worked for the prison service, he may well have been 
in administration, a clerical worker or a teacher, but it seems he was working at least that night as a prison guard. Uh, the other bit of information that we're learning is that uh, Mr Epstein's uh, cellmate uh, had been moved out of their cell the previous day, leaving him alone, and US media is suggesting that that may have been against protocol to leave him in a cell by himself. And of course, remember, he was on suicide watch in the last few weeks, having been found unconscious on the floor of his cell with some marks around his neck. All of this fueling, of course, the many conspiracy theories. That was Peter Bowes. Still to come in this podcast. One of rock music's most famous instruments is going on display. Well, parts of it anyway. Wednesday marks the first anniversary of the devastating collapse of a motorway bridge in the Italian city of Genoa, which killed 43 people and left hundreds homeless. With the Italian government heading for possible fresh elections, Helen Grady reports on how the populist coalition has responded to the disaster. At 11.36 exactly, on the 14th day of every month, people gather where the Morandi Bridge used to be. He fell with the bridge. The car was destroyed. It got stuck on a column of rubble. Emmanuel Diaz's brother Henry was one of the 43 people who died when the bridge collapsed. He didn't realise death was kissing him. I think he must have had a split second of awareness. Just one second. But who can understand the intensity of that second? The disaster has left Italians wondering how something so vital could be allowed to fail and how many more ageing roads and bridges might crumble. It's also tested Italy's populist coalition government. Italy's Minister for Transport and Infrastructure, Danilo Toninelli, is a member of the Five Star Movement. He's been quick to blame the company that managed the bridge, Autostrade, and wants to revoke its contract to run 3,000 kilometres of Italian roads. What the Genoa Bridge collapse has revealed is how some private sector contractors put profits ahead of safety. We believe we've met the legal criteria for cutting short the contract, because obviously a company that allows a bridge to collapse is not fit to look after it. Autostrade is fighting to keep its contract it denies that it puts profits before safety and says it spent 9 million euros on the bridge in the three years before it failed. Genoa's deputy public prosecutor, Paolo Dovidio, thinks the disaster could and should have been prevented. High above the city from his ninth floor office, he's investigating around 80 people, from senior managers to engineers and technicians. The problems with this bridge were known. They'd been known for some time. It's a miracle it didn't collapse sooner. It could have happened three, five, even ten years before. They delayed, they delayed, they delayed until... Does the evidence suggest that Autostrada knew that the bridge could collapse? That's a hard line to draw. The doubt remains that there was a criminal undervaluation of the risk, if not more. The safety checks carried out on the bridge raised significant alarms. These alarms were not listened to. Autostrade told us... None of the experts reporting to us ever raised any form of alarm or indicated any need for urgent intervention. People in Genoa will mark this anniversary just as they have every month, with prayers and by ringing a bell for each of the 43 people who died. Emmanuel Diaz, whose brother Henry died on the bridge, doesn't have much faith in politicians to prevent a repeat of the disaster. Instead, he's putting his trust in the Italian legal system. My job now is to get justice for Henry. That's my life. 
because they took a part of me. They took a person who was fundamental to me. I know there are people who are responsible. I know there are people who must be punished. And I'm very confident we will get justice, because that's what Italy wants. What do you do when you are dead? You rise again. Italy will send a message to the world, because Italy wants to return to the great power it used to be. I know there will be justice for this tragedy. Emmanuel Diaz, whose brother died in the disaster, ending that report by Helen Grady in Genoa. Now to a precious natural resource that's running out. Sand. It's an incredibly lucrative commodity because it's used for so many things like construction, electronics and glass. In India, the second biggest consumer after China, a black market is thriving, stripping riverbeds and beaches bare to meet the demand. Shaima Khalil has been speaking to Vince Beiser, who wrote a book about the issue. It seems really hard to believe because there is so much sand in the world, right? But the thing is, sand is actually the natural resource that we consume more than any other in the world except for water. And that's because sand is the main raw material that our cities are made out of, right? Every concrete structure in the world, every shopping mall, office tower, apartment block is made mainly out of concrete. And all the glass in the, all the windows in all those buildings are also made out of sand. Glass is just sand that's been melted down. Sand even makes things like the silicon chips in our computers and our, and our uh, cell phones. So when you add it all up, especially concrete more than anything else, it turns out we're using about 50 billion tons of sand and gravel every year. And we're running out of it, which means there's a huge competition over it. I know that you've spent years researching this. What did you find in terms of sand as a commodity, but also the fight over it as a resource? So, yeah, the thing is, there is so much demand for sand in today's world, uh, and we're having to harvest, to mine so much of it that in many, many places around the world, we're doing huge in damage to the environment to get at it. We are stripping riverbeds bare, stripping beaches bare, tearing up forests and farmlands, all to get at that sand. And in some places, it's gotten so bad that organized crime has actually moved into the business, uh, and they do what organized criminal do everywhere, which means that hundreds of people have been murdered over sand in the last few years. Where exactly? So the violence is is really at its worst, as far as I can tell, in India. There are literally hundreds of people, and I'm talking about uh, environmental activists, journalists, police officers, government officials, basically anybody who tries to get in the way of these sand gangs. They actually call them sand mafias wow. in India. Also in Kenya, uh, at least a dozen people have been killed in the last few years in fighting over sand. That's sometimes it's rival gangs fighting over sand supply, just like drug gangs. Sometimes it's it's villagers, you know, people who make their living from fishing in a river and their livelihoods are destroyed when the sand miners come to town. Uh, and in places like Gambia, also, uh, a year or two ago, there were some people shot dead when they tried to protest illegal sand mining that was going on. From your research, how big is the black market for sand and how dependent are constructing companies uh, on it? So nobody knows for sure, of course, but uh, the best estimates put the black market in the billions of dollars every year. When we talk about the developers and the builders, it's very helpful to them, basically because it's it's cheaper. That's why they go to the black market. It's cheaper than buying sand that's made legally. But they don't depend on it in the sense that if you could wave a magic wand and, and get rid of all illegal sand tomorrow, there would still be plenty of sand. It would just be more expensive. Hard as it is to imagine, could we run out? What would that look like? It'll be quite a long time before we actually run out of sand, before we you know, get down to the very last grains of sand on Earth. But a way to think about it is, is, is if you think about what's happening with oil and, and gas around the world, right? It, there's plenty of oil and gas left in the world, but the stuff that's easy to get, the stuff that's close to the surface and easy to get, is increasingly tapped out. And so we're having to go further and further and do more and more damage to get at the stuff that's left. Simon Khalil was speaking to Vince Beiser. In June, the United Kingdom joined Belgium, France and Finland in regulating gender stereotypes in adverts. Now, the first ads to fall foul of the rules have been banned. Amy Leibowitz has the details. Yeah. Let's not tell Mark. 
that sneaky, let's not tell mum, is from one of two adverts that has been banned from the British Advertising Standards Authority under its new rules. The promotion for Philadelphia soft cheese highlights a father leaving a baby on a restaurant conveyor belt as he's distracted by food, suggesting that he's incapable of looking after a baby. The other advert for Volkswagen shows a montage of men being adventurous while a woman sits in a park next to a pram. Jess Ty, the investigations manager at the Advertising Standards Authority, argues that research proves that these regulations are strongly needed. The research that we carried out showed that there are real-world harms that come from gender stereotypes, and obviously advertising only plays a small part in that. Gender stereotypes are pervasive throughout society. It's not about suggesting that one particular ad is going to automatically cause harm, but it's about thinking about what the cumulative impact of those harmful gender stereotypes being depicted in as, you know, what real harms that might cause. A little girl choosing not to study engineering, for example, that's not something any of us want to see. And it's only right that we as the advertising regulator step in to ensure that advertising doesn't contribute to those harms. The authority also highlights that the view that adverts of men and women failing to achieve a task specifically because of their gender is more common than one would think. Since the rise of the Me Too movement, companies, it's claimed, has been quite clever at using the discussion around gender equality to their advantage. But something finally changed. Allegations regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment. And there will be no going back. Because we, we believe in the best in men. Using gender stereotypes in adverts is now against the law in the United Kingdom and some other countries. But when will these such moves translate into lasting change? Good question, Amy. That was Amy Leibowitz. And finally, one of rock history's most famous instruments, the guitar used for the cover of London Calling by the English band The Clash, is to go on display here in London, but in pieces. Terry Egan reports. London Calling to the faraway towns Now war is declared London Calling by the punk group The Clash. The guitar used to drive that song, though, a Fender Precision bass, was famously smashed up on a New York stage in 1979. The bassist, Paul Simonon, said he wrecked it out of frustration, and an image capturing the moment is one of rock's most famous. Now that guitar, what's left of it, is to go on show in the Museum of London, 40 years after it was trashed. But I had no fear, cause London is drowning I live by the river. The Clash embraced reggae, blues and funk. London Calling, which sparked success for the band in the US, explored issues of unemployment, drug use and racial tension. Simonon, though, said he regretted breaking his favourite instrument, and so kept the bits. Now, as part of an exhibition of more than a hundred items from the band's archive, including notes, clothing, images and music, they'll be brought together to form the focal point of this exhibition. A nuclear error, but I have no fear, cause London is drowning and I, I live by the river. Any excuse to play The Clash. That report was by Terry Egan. Should I stay or should I go now? Well, that's it from us for this Global News podcast, but there will be an updated version later. If you would like to comment on this one or the topics we've covered, do please send us an email. You know how to do that. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. I'm Jackie Leonard, and until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.